going to kick us off today is Dawn, Dawn E. Collett. Dawn likes to tinker with cloud infrastructure and security and regularly goes down rabbit holes in a futile search a futile search for ways to develop systems that are both reliable and impenetrable. As well as accidental accessibility advocacy, Dawn can regularly be found sharing knowledge within the Melbourne cloud infrastructure and DevOps communities. Outside work, Dawn is an occasional author, a kitchen alchemist, and a raging sports ball fan. Over to you, Dawn. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Am I hooked up to the AV? So, I was supposed to come here today to talk to you about web accessibility. But unfortunately, on my flight from Melbourne to Perth yesterday, my talk was disabled. So I'm going to spend approximately the next 45 minutes explaining to you how we go about re-enabling it. If you want to follow along with the sources that I used when I was putting together this talk, you can scan that QR code up there or go to the GitHub link. That will take you to a GitHub repository, which has all of the sources sorted by type. To begin with, I want to acknowledge the fact that I am presenting today on Aboriginal land. I want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land here, the Wajuk Nyungar people, and also the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, on whose land this talk came into being. This country is and always will be Aboriginal land. Their sovereignty was never ceded. I also want to tip my hat to the old men and women, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander mentors that I myself had growing up. Because among many other incredibly valuable lessons that I learned from them, they taught me about the importance of stories. And I wouldn't be here giving this presentation to you today without them. I also want to thank all of the sponsors who have made this possible. It has been amazing to be able to come from Melbourne to Perth to do this, already to meet so many awesome people. And it would not be possible without all of the sponsors. You've kind of got the introduction there. That's me. My name is Dawn. My day job is I'm an engineer at Enabler. We are a tiny little consultancy in Melbourne. We love solving DevOps and cloudy type problems. That's what I do in my day job. If you want to know more about that, you can ask me more. But the reason that I'm here speaking to all of you today is because I am an accidental accessibility advocate. We're going to get back to that one. As Hannah said, outside of work, I am an occasional author and kitchen alchemist. Sometimes that ends really well, sometimes it doesn't. I am also a raging sports ball fan, hence that picture and this being me in Boston Bruins clothing. That's a hockey team for the record. So the accidental accessibility advocate bit. The last two words of that are very easy to understand. The accidental is a bit less so. And in order to explain that, I need to take you on a little bit of a tour. And we are going to start that tour in the UK with this excellent disabled toilet which is down a set of stairs. I don't know if any of you have ever tried to take a wheelchair down a set of stairs. Do not recommend. Over in New Zealand, much closer to home, we do actually have a ramp to be able to get into this building. But unfortunately for the poor power chair user who's currently sitting and staring at it, it is blocked off by a couple of large orange traffic cones. Again, if you want to get into the building, not absolutely conducive to that. And finally, the place where I conceived this talk and the place where I live, in Melbourne, we have these exaloos around the place, um, space age public toilets, if you will. And the reason why these made it into a talk about accidental accessibility advocacy is because they have a cleaning cycle which runs. And that is indicated by a large light which will go on in the cubicle of the toilet. There is also a panel in the toilet which explains that when the large light goes on, you should vacate because it's about to start its cleaning cycle. That panel is translated into Braille. Braille, blind people, light, doesn't quite compute there. So before I get on, let's define a few important terms. To begin with, disability by the Australian definition, is a continuing condition which restricts everyday activities. A continuing condition means that it's likely to last for six months or more. The restricting everyday activities bit is fairly self-explanatory. Then there's accessibility, and that's the degree to which an activity can be done by everyone. Now, this is not just about disability. 
One case study that I like to use here is from about December 2009. If anyone remembers HP's racist webcam, where a black gentleman had gone out and bought himself a state-of-the-art HP laptop, which had a wonderful web camera, which was supposed to be able to do facial recognition, except it couldn't until he got his white coworker to test it. And then there's adaptive technology. And those are tools that disabled people to use to improve access. That can be exceptionally low tech. This, my walking stick, is a piece of adaptive technology. Wheelchairs are adaptive technology. Some things that we use in architecture, like ramps, can be part of adaptive technology. But in the broader sense, in terms of technical pieces of adaptive technology, we're talking here about things like screen readers, things like adaptive and augmentative communication, things which are essentially attached to a computer. And warning, this is where we get political for a minute. Excuse me, as I get back to the right slide. There are broadly two different ways that we can define disability medical model and the social model. The medical model of disability holds that disability itself is a problem, that disability is something that we should try to resolve, something that we should try to cure. And that is illustrated here by this uh, clip art blob in a wheelchair being comforted by a vaguely doctor looking clip art blob. On the other hand, the social model holds that it's not so much disability that's the problem, it's accessibility. That we shouldn't be trying to change people, we should be trying to change the world around them to make it easier to navigate. And when that goes well, that's illustrated by things like adaptive sports that we have over here. You know, these people who are playing sports in wheelchairs look perfectly happy doing. And I wouldn't want to dismiss the medical model entirely, because there are some great interventions that have come out of that. But for the purposes of the work that we're doing, the way that I would suggest that we look at this is through the lens of the social model. We want to try to modify the environment to make it easier for people to use. And if you're here, I feel pretty confident in saying that this is part of your job. So to illustrate that, let's look at a few case studies of how this goes well and how this goes badly. This is arngren.net, and I didn't have to look very hard to find this. It's on a great many list of top 10 worst websites ever. And it's visually very cluttered. You can see that, I mean, it would probably make more sense to me if I spoke Norwegian, but you've got a bunch of pictures here which are all very confused. You've got a bunch of colors. There's not really a whole lot of structure to it. And it would not surprise you that if you try to navigate arngren.net with a screen reader, you're going to have a great deal of difficulty doing it because that structure that's replicated, that structure that we see here visually, is replicated in the lack of structure that you get when trying to navigate it with a screen reader. There's a hell of a lot of red and green here, and that's really difficult for colorblind people. Unsurprisingly, many of the images here don't actually have alt text, and it's also not clear which images are tied to which links because of the lack of structure. And then there's distinctive design. This is Ling's cars, and you may or may not believe this, but this is actually one of the most successful car leasing businesses in the United Kingdom. And it is built around the brand of Ling Valentine, the owner. And the brand is obvious. Ling's face is animated. The uh, tongue with the British flag on it is animated. The traffic lights are animated. And my favorite bit, which I couldn't get into this screenshot from when I originally took it, was the gif of Boris Johnson shrugging used to illustrate the Boris Brexit guarantee that if the UK left the EU, the cost of leasing your car would not go up. But if you want to build a distinctive website like this, there are a lot of considerations that go into it. You have to think about things like that text across the top. That's not text. That's actually clip art. So it's not necessarily going to be immediately apparent that that's the launching point of your page. And you also need to then add alt text to it. You can have issues with backgrounds, making it difficult for people to navigate things. You know, there is a lot of alt text that has gone into this website, but when I originally looked at it, there wasn't a lot of it there. There were a lot of scenarios where pictures were used to illustrate things without something that would be backed up by a screen reader. And if you have photo sensitivity problems, you are not going to have fun trying to navigate this site. Then there's an example of good design, and this is one that probably a lot of us use every day, and that is GitHub. GitHub does a few things really well that are not necessarily intuitive. 
To start with, if you look at that top bar over there, you can see that you've got the GitHub logo, the search bar, but then next to it, you've actually got pull requests, issues, marketplace explore. And those are easy anchors for screen reader users to be able to get to the areas of GitHub that they might frequently use. GitHub is very, very good about not just conveying information with color. The layout is quite easy to understand visually. It scales very well. And this is actually a screenshot of the NVDA repo, the free and open source screen reader for Windows. And the people who developed NVDA migrated it over to GitHub because they found that for their users, the vast majority of whom are screen reader users, GitHub was a very easy way for them to submit bugs. If you want to do this well, there are a bunch of resources for it. The web content accessibility guides are sort of the canonical resource. But if you find those too difficult, or if you're doing this for the first time and you want something that's a bit easier to understand, the Accessibility Project has produced a checklist where you can just go down the checklist and it conveys it all to you in a much simpler manner. And you can pretty much just tick boxes to work out, do you actually follow the guidelines? One thing that I don't talk very much about in this talk is designing for intellectual and cognitive disabilities. But the main resource that you're going to want for that is the US Federal Plain Language Guidelines. These are published by the US government. And they provide you instructions on how to use plain, clear English, which is going to be easier for people with intellectual and cognitive disabilities to understand. And there's a blind lady called Christy Veers who produced a video which went viral on Twitter showing how she uses her iPhone. And this, I think, is a really important thing for people to see. Not because, well, because it shows you what's possible when you think outside the box and when you design these things taking into account a wide variety of different perspectives. The iPhone has braille keyboards. It has a great number of haptic touch features which deliver data that you would usually only get visually. In the resources for accessible design, there are a, there's a web page which links to a whole list of different resources. I'm gonna call out a few of them here that I think are important. And the first one is the Axe Core Accessibility Testing Library. Now, this is very important for accessibility because it is entirely open source and it's what Google's accessibility checker and a lot of other similar things are built on. The Color Oracle desktop filter is a very important one for color blindness. And the reason why I'm calling this tool out specifically is there are a bunch of browser extensions that you can get, but the Color Oracle desktop filter is the only one that will allow you to plug it into desktop applications as well. So if you're developing a desktop application rather than a web application, that's a very useful tool. If you want to test what you're doing with a screen reader, the Pacciello Group, one of the very early accessibility consultancies, produced a list of basic screen reader commands for pretty much all of the common screen readers. And you can just get those up on a computer and try them out yourself. Additionally, the researchers at the University of Maryland produced the photosensitive epilepsy analysis tool a few years ago. And that one is really important because photosensitive epilepsy is a disability that we can't ask people to test for. If you're asking people to test for that and they have a seizure, that's potentially going to be threatening to their health or in the worst case, threatening to their life. So the researchers at the University of Maryland produced this tool, which basically allows you to check the contrast and animations on your website to ensure that they're not going to be a problem for people with photosensitive epilepsy. Now guidelines are great. Guidelines are a really good starting point, but guidelines do not tell the whole story. This really comes down to that often misused adage of the 80-20 principle. And I'll sum it up like this. The vast majority of accessibility issues that you might run into can be very easily solved by looking at and understanding the guidelines. But there are some accessibility issues that the guidelines don't cover. And there are situations where the guidelines are misleading. In those sorts of scenarios, what you want to do is make sure that you have a clear and understandable path for people who have those issues to come to you, report them, and get them to the right people so that they are going to be actioned. 
And with most accessibility talks, this is the point at which the person giving the talk would explain to you how to solve one particular problem in one particular language for one particular scenario. This is not one of that talks. And the reason for that is because I think it's often very instructive to look at the ways that people do this wrong so that we can learn from them and hopefully not repeat the mistakes. This is Atlassian Confluence. And my assumption is that the vast majority of the people in the audience here have used Atlassian Confluence before. For those of you who haven't, it's basically a shared documentation wiki. So you've got a test space here. You've got a bunch of data. You can click around it. You can go in and create pages. And when you click the button to create a page, you get something back that looks a bit like this. And that looks fine, right? But we're going to go back and look at that again. Because despite the fact that this page was created in my test space, which you can see because my name is up there, I actually wasn't the person who created it. It was created by someone called Matthew Gregory. And at the time that I first gave this talk, Matt was my manager. So why was it that Matt was the person who was creating this page and not me? Well. That would be your answer, because when I went into Confluence back in the day and I tried to create pages, what I would get is that the button there would be cut off the bottom of the screen, which meant that I could not navigate to it, which meant that I could not create pages. Oops. So you can actually scroll the options within the Confluence pop-up, and Atlassian have done a bit of work in fixing this since. but. What this essentially meant at the time was that if you were using a magnified screen for particular configurations, because you couldn't scroll the whole screen to see the whole pop-up, you just wouldn't be able to create pages at all. Or you would have to learn how to tab navigate your way around blind without screen reader cues to be able to do it. And that pretty much meant that that was a piece of work that I just offloaded onto my colleagues every time I needed to create a page. I called someone over and I went, hey, can you come do this for me, please? So how do we improve it? Well, you want to make sure that your UI elements are all scrollable and that nothing is cut off by the bottom of the screen. So you want to set it up so that it's not just you know, scrolling the options within the pop-up, but the whole page there is scrollable. You want to make sure that you test your pop-up windows for accessibility. So looking at things like, do they block out other elements of the user interface? If someone is using a zoomed-in screen or a screen reader, can they actually navigate their way around this pop-up window without losing focus, without things being cut off the bottom of the screen? And the best way to deal with it is you zoom it up yourself, or you find a visually impaired person, you get them to test it for you. And that will very quickly show you where a lot of those issues are going to be. I need a human screen reader. Now, I was not the person who said this. The person who said I need a human screen reader was my friend's grandmother. She is unfortunately now deceased. She was a lovely person. And later on in life, due to a degenerative disease, she became blind. Now, she was quite religious. And she used the Patheos website, which billed itself as hosting the conversation on faith to keep in touch with her religious community when she was no longer able to easily go to church. And when she started using Patheos many, many years ago, it looked like this. And visually, that site is not too bad. It was also not all that bad to navigate with a screen reader. It wasn't perfect, but you could see where things were. You could relatively easily navigate your way around most of it. And it was fairly apparent what was going on where. They'd also designed it in such a way that you didn't have auto-playing videos and cluttered pop-ups which would come up and block your view of part of the page. Until in late 2017, early 2018, Patheos went through a redesign. And at the end of the redesign, their website looked like this. And I can't show you the accessibility issues with their website. Because some of the problems that they had were so bad that at the time I was originally putting this talk together, a lot of the major browsers released a feature that blocked a lot of these obnoxious pop-ups on site. That, the beginning of that text there, advertisement, I wasn't using an ad blocker when I did this. That was just blocked. But back in the day, when my friend's grandmother was trying to use this website, 
what would happen was she would tab around and suddenly she would find herself in an ad pop-up or there would be auto playing videos that were talking over her screen reader, which meant that she couldn't hear the cues that she needed to navigate around the website. And that made her feel something like this. She was not happy, she was not very pleased, and she no longer used the Patheos website. If you want an example of this closer to home, Coles, the big supermarket chain, got sued by a screen reader user because their website for online ordering was not accessible with a screen reader. And Coles ended up settling that lawsuit. And one of the stipulations of the settlement was that Coles actually had to make sure that their online website was accessible to screen reader users. So if you want to have a look at someone who does this really well, Coles is it, and that's because now they know they have to do it. Oops. So the sound on auto-playing videos talks over screen readers. And when you think about the fact that screen readers are providing auditory cues to help you with the visual cues that you miss if you're vision impaired, that can be quite a big problem. But the bigger problem is that if you can't see the video on the page, you're relying on being able to hear the screen reader's triggers that will tell you how to close it. If the video is talking over the screen reader, that's not something that you're going to be able to do. And what's even worse is that some of these pop-up advertisements and auto-playing videos will actually take screen readers into an entirely new container, which acts as a new page. And then you just get a bunch of triggers that go image, 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 item, text, and so on and so forth, looping around. And if you are a screen reader user expecting to see a whole page and you don't know what's happened, that can be really confusing. To make matters worse, not all pop-ups and auto-playing videos have a dismiss button that will even work if you don't have a mouse. There are some scenarios in which you set up your whole page and you go through and you try and make sure that you can actually close things and you find that that close trigger or that dismiss trigger just isn't visible if you're navigating via keyboard. It's not correctly placed and that can be a really big problem. So how do we improve it? Well, it's pretty good design, just let people decide whether they want to play videos. Auto playing videos are really annoying and it is even more important to let users decide because of the accessibility implications of this. You also want to make it easy for keyboard navigators and screen reader users to ignore or close those pop-up elements. So make sure that the dismiss trigger is easily visible to a screen reader. Make sure that it's very early on. Make sure that it's placed in the sort of location that they would think it would be. Now, Safari has a reader mode. A lot of other browsers have reader mode extensions. There's even one you can get for the CLI, which I probably need to go back and add to the sources at some point. But what reader mode essentially does is it strips out everything on the website except for the text and the images. And that can be a really useful fallback for blind or visually impaired people because the screen reader is then going to be able to readily navigate around it. So do check to make sure that your HTML is properly formatted. Check to make sure that reader mode works the way that you would expect it to. And then put on a blindfold, cover your screen, use a screen reader yourself. It's not going to be as good as getting people who use it day to day, but you will very quickly pick up on what the issues might be when you do a direct comparison of what the screen reader gives you to what you actually get when you look at it visually. Does anyone here remember GeoCities? Cool, yeah, we have an audience of people that remember GeoCities. For those of you who don't, GeoCities websites tended to look something like this. This is admittedly one of the less obnoxious options that I could have picked, but it's still very emblematic of what web design in that sort of era was like. We've got the word art, we've got the dancing penguin, we've got a bunch of clashing colors, we've got broken links, we've got a whole lot of text in different colors in Thai. Um, all that we're really missing is, you know, the line of rainbow Kirby's jumping across the top and then it would be very much a GeoCities website. GeoCities is dead. Yahoo bought it and they killed it off in March of 2019. Fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, a lot of the people who came into uh, web design in the era where GeoCities was state of the art now actually have quite a lot of creative control over their own websites. And many of them have incorporated some of these elements of the GeoCities era into their corporate websites, which is Essentially the equivalent of taking your very productive business's fancy corporate website, we are very amazing and we will show you why, 
and putting a yan cat across the top of it, which is not something that I'm going to recommend unless whatever your business is, is very, very niche. I have a friend who has photosensitive epilepsy and she works in the IT industry. Several years ago, she had an encounter with one of these enterprising designers from the GeoCities era. She heard about this particular tech company and she wanted to see what they were all about and so she went to their website. And what she encountered there was a giant strobing pink element that took up the top two thirds of her screen, which pretty much immediately caused her to have a seizure. And the end result of that was that the enterprising designer had a phone call, which I really suspect that he probably didn't want to be on the other end of. Oops. So flashing, flickering, and strobing effects are one of the major causes of seizures. And if you're a video game player and you get games in physical boxes, if you flip over to the back of the game, quite often they have that little bit of text there that says, hey, there's a flashing, flickering, and strobing warning here. If you're photosensitive, you want to be careful about playing this. That's what that is for. And it's much more severe generally if you're looking at saturated reds, pinks, oranges, and really high contrast effects. So if you're strobing something from pink to white or red to white, that's going to be much more of a problem than a tiny little animation in the corner that's going dark blue to dark green. Particularly because photosensitive epilepsy is a spectrum from mild to severe. At the milder end, it's quite easy to work out, but my friend being one of the more severe cases runs into this more often than she should. And so you've got to be aware then of what the parameters are that you're dealing with. So how do we improve it? Well, to begin with, if you can, you want to avoid using those flashing, flickering, and strobing effects. If you do need to use them, the two changes that you want to make are you want to make sure that they are low contrast, and you want to make sure that they're as small as possible. That flashing from dark blue to dark green in the corner is not going to be nearly as much of a problem as the giant strobing pink element that takes up the top two thirds of your page. And if you can avoid it, don't use particularly saturated reds and pinks and also sometimes oranges for those sorts of flashing effects. If you really want to do this well and you have a website where you absolutely have to have animation on it, give users the option to disable and enable it at will. That's the sort of thing that's really useful for scenarios like Ling's cars, because it means that if you have people who have those sorts of photosensitivity issues, they can still actually access your website, even if it's not quite in the way that you might have intended. Now, there is actually a certain amount of precedent for disabled people being involved in integrated sports. And that can be everything from kids playing in the schoolyard to Olympic champions like Reto Ildiko, the Hungarian fencer, and Im Dong Hyun, the Korean archer. But for this specific case study, I want to look at a more modern version of sports. We're going to look at eSports, specifically League of Legends. This is, for those of you who are not into video games, pretty much a computerized tower defense. You have teams of five people, and they're trying to defend a tower. Each of the people on those five teams can pick characters or champions that have different abilities. And League of Legends has a really thriving professional scene. You can actually make a decent living playing League of Legends professionally if you're very good at it. Several years ago, the creators of League of Legends introduced a new champion called Tom Kench. And this is the titular catfish. You can see there, redfish on the left and greenfish on the right. Tom Kench had a mechanic that no other character in the game had had before, and that mechanic is called gray health. And this is where we find out how many colorblind people are in the audience today. Because for those of you who are not colorblind, if you have a look at that on the red side, you can see that there's a chunk of the health bar that's red, then there's a big chunk of the health bar that's gray, and that's essentially acting as a shield, which means that at this point, Tom Kench is unkillable. And then on the right-hand side, you've got that little bit which is kind of shaded out red, and that's the health that he's lost. But if I put a color blindness filter over that, particularly on the left side, the red side, which is the enemy side, that's suddenly not so clear. And given that somewhere between 8 and 10% of the population, mostly men, are colorblind, it was inevitable that when with teams of five, you were eventually going to have a tweet like this from a professional player. If you didn't know, I'm colorblind, along with two other members of my team. All three of us can't see what health he's at in colorblind mode, he being Tom Kench here. 
Again, these are professional players. This is something that they need to be able to do to do their job. Oops. So most colorblind people can't tell the difference between red and green. But as you can see there from the colorblind filter, the other crucial bit of information here is the contrast between colors. If you can't distinguish the difference between particular colors, you're going to use that contrast to see, is this what I think it is or is it not? Because what you basically get with colors that colorblind people can't see is they'll generally look some variation of gray, black, brown, or black, or they'll be ambiguous. And the way that we improve this to start with is by using a contrast checker to make sure that elements are going to be viewable to people with all different types of color blindness. And I'm not just talking about red and green color blindness here, which are the most common types. You will also need to design for blue color blindness and people with no color vision at all. Slack does this really well. Slack for many years has had accessibility themes for protonopia and deuteranopia, so red, green color blindness, but also for tritonopia, which is blue. GitHub is another one that more recently has done that very well. And even if you have a colorblind mode, particularly if you're just designing for red and green color blindness, try putting a filter over it, get people to test it, and make sure that it actually does what you think it would do. Riot Games, the creators of League of Legends, to their credit, did actually fix this quite quickly when it came to their attention. But it's that sort of user acceptance testing that can often pick up those issues before they get to production. And if you're building a colorblind mode for something, you want to try and make sure that you're using meaningful icons or meaningful information to indicate different elements and states, not just color. If what you're getting is, you know, we're using a square, a circle, and a rectangle to try to tell the difference between these things, that's not much better. Whereas if you've got a great big tick, it's going to be apparent what it means, whether it's green or not. It's 2020 round three, and I can't believe I'm saying this, but if we cast our mind back a few years to 2020 round one, before the whole COVID pandemic thing happened, you might remember, I certainly do in Melbourne, we had pretty extensive bushfires which blanketed quite a lot of the country in smoke. And through bushfires and through the COVID-19 pandemic, a lot of people became aware of different aspects of accessibility that they hadn't been aware of before. And one of these was sign language interpreters because every time we had the prime minister or a premier or a chief health officer or someone from the emergency services coming onto our televisions giving broadcasts, there was always an Australian sign language interpreter next to them. And that was to ensure that for people where sign language is their first language, they were able to get that information conveyed to them in a timely manner in case they needed to evacuate or to make sure that they knew what health orders were changing. But sign language interpretation is not the only way to make things accessible to people who are deaf or hard of hearing. You also want to look at things like captions, and a lot of people will do that using automated captioning solutions, which can be great until they're not, as illustrated by this tweet from Cal Montgomery, a disability activist based out of the US. If you value us equally and want us to participate fully, we need full access to the Paul Say briefing with enough lead time to absorb it. That chance is gone for this year, which means that you have just sabotaged your own legislative agenda by leaving advocates unprepared. Now, Cal here was referring to one of the biggest disability organizations in the US who had run an event, the Paul Say briefing. And if you're wondering what Paul Say means, that's how the automated captioning solution that they said was adequate for people to access that briefing rendered the term policy. The rest, of the, the rest of the transcript of the briefing was similarly garbled. Now, that's actually not that hard to solve. It just requires a bit of human review afterwards. And one group of people that do this really well are the podcasts This American Life, which is backed by National Public Radio in the US. They do have a note on their website that says This American Life is produced for the ear and designed to be heard. But they produce transcripts which are run through an automated transcription engine and then corrected manually by human captioners. And what that means is that if you are deaf, if you are hard of hearing, or if you have auditory processing issues or for any other reason are text reliant, you can go through and read through that transcript and it will provide you with all of the information. 
One group of people that don't do this quite so well are Guardian Australia, and this is relevant because they produced one of the better sources of information in audio form about what was actually going on in terms of health roundups and things during the COVID-19 pandemic. But their approach to transcribing things can be described with this headline here, Guardian Podcasts, why no transcripts? That is to say that their approach is to not transcribe anything at all. Which means that if you are deaf or hard of hearing or otherwise text reliant, you cannot actually access any of the material that Guardian Australia produces in audio form. Oops. And this is also important because text reliant people aren't necessarily deaf or hard of hearing. Autistic people, people with ADHD, people with sensory processing disorders, people who are on a busy train and want to be able to read information rather than listening to it. People with disorders like tinnitus, which affect the hearing in situational manners, are all going to find themselves text reliant at some point or another, even if it's not all the time. So how do we improve it? You want to provide transcripts for any spoken audio on your website, and you want to make sure that you caption any videos. But do bear in mind that automated transcription software is not a complete solution. If you get a human to correct the transcription before it's published, you're going to produce something that people can actually access. And the captions which were done by Netflix for Stranger Things sort of made their way around the internet multiple times because they did a lot of other things really well in terms of describing changes in vocal tone and background noise. If you're producing particularly video content or complex video content, that's really important. Hacking an artificial pancreas. Now, that can be read in two different ways. We can talk about hacking together an artificial pancreas, or we can talk about hacking into an artificial pancreas but this case study actually covers both. This is a Medtronic Mini Med insulin pump. It is used by people who are insulin dependent with diabetes. Basically, the pump sits just under your skin, you plug it in and it delivers insulin at regular intervals without you having to inject yourself. That's really good for a lot of people. There's also been another recent invention of the constant blood glucose monitor. And that, again, similarly sits just below your skin, provides information on what your blood glucose is all the time. And these Medtronic Minimed insulin pumps had a really interesting security flaw, which resulted in a lot of people with diabetes hunting them down. Because what you could do is there was an unsecured radio frequency, which was used by the remotes. But you could also hook that up with a bridge between it and a little bit of open source source code to a constant blood glucose monitor and have the insulin pump react and deliver insulin at various intervals based on that. But the problem is that security flaws always come with other issues. And the fact that you could hook in via this piece of source code also meant that your Medtronic Minimed insulin pump was potentially vulnerable to hacker attacks, which is not great because that allows you to actually modify the amount of insulin that you give to someone. So the FDA, the drug regulator in the US, were made aware of this, and they went away and issued an alert on it. But there were a few enterprising hacker types in the healthcare industry who didn't think that they were taking this very seriously. So they got out their phones, and they did a little bit of coding, and they produced an Android app, which you could use to hook into that really common frequency on any Medtronic Minimed insulin pump in the immediate vicinity, and either entirely withhold insulin from its user or deliver a lethal dose of insulin immediately which finally resulted in Medtronic recalling their vulnerable Minimed insulin pumps. Oh dear. And this is where we get into the fact that accessibility is not just about web accessibility. In some scenarios, security issues and many other types of issues can actually be accessibility problems. Medical devices, you're dealing with people's lives. It's really important. And what's more problematic is that if you're regulated by an external organization like the FDA, you may not hear about these issues quickly. In some scenarios, you may not actually hear about them at all. So how do we improve this? You want to start by considering the possible attack vectors. A lot of this is just good basic security. Get a good pen testing company in, particularly hardware pen testers for stuff like medical devices, before your device goes to market. And make sure that if people notify you about security vulnerabilities, you respond promptly. 
Because the really sad thing about this use case is that unintended users can actually be a business opportunity. And Medtronic weren't the ones that ended up capitalizing on it. There were a couple of different companies who saw these issues and produced secure insulin pumps, which were set up properly, which you could use to hook into derivatives of that original source code on a secure channel to produce your closed loop insulin delivery system. And this is where we get to my favorite case study of the bunch, because this is another one that concerns me. I have been giving this talk since 2019. And when I realized that I was going to be talking to people a lot about accessibility, when I became an accidental accessibility advocate, I went, OK, I've got to find some way of making sure that I know about what is going on in the accessibility world. And one way that I did that was through my LinkedIn feed. So I was looking at a lot of information about accessibility. I was following the accessibility hashtag. And one day, I was going through my LinkedIn feed, and a post popped up saying, there's an accessibility consultant that's giving a talk about accessibility on this date, at this time, at this venue. And I went, great, cool. I know some things about accessibility. I know quite a lot about the things that are directly applicable to me, as well as more about the things that are applicable to my friends, people that I know. But there's always something that you can learn from scenarios like this. So I go along, I get off work at 4.30, I take the train to the venue to see this. That's a set of stairs. But that wasn't the only set of stairs to get into the building. There were, in fact, three similar sets of stairs, that one and two more after the glass door, to get to the lift, which would then take you up to where the event was being held. And I described this to a couple of friends of mine as being like a room bar, just sitting at the bottom of a set of stairs, repeatedly shouting error 406, which, for those of you who are not well versed in HTML error codes, means not acceptable. So I get up there. I listened to the whole talk, and I had basically crawled up. I, I basically crawled up the last flight of stairs to get there. And I said to the accessibility consultant, does it strike you as ironic that you're giving a talk about web accessibility in a venue that's inaccessible? And he looks at me and he goes, you know, I hadn't really thought about that. And I don't think that I need to explain the irony here, but we're going to do the post-mortem anyway. So if you're running events, and full credit to DDD Perth here because they've done a brilliant job of this, you want to make sure that your venues are wheelchair accessible. You want to make sure that they have disabled bathrooms. So many times I have gone to events to find that the disabled bathrooms are on a different floor, or they're locked, or no one knows where they are, or you've got to go and talk to security to actually get the key. But there are more advanced types of things that you can do which help people with a variety of different disabilities. So you want to look at things like providing quiet spaces for people, which again is something that DDD Perth has done. And making sure that there is a lot of different adaptive technology around. So sign language interpreters. If you've got hearing loops, one of my friends has been hard of hearing basically her whole life, went and got fitted with a hearing aid yeah, in her 40s. And she called me up and she said, Dawn, I am so happy because for the first time I can hear the announcements at the train station when I turn on my hearing aid and I plug it into the hearing loop. And things like you know, audio descriptions of slides, you'll see as I go through this talk, I've tried to describe everything that's on the slides as I go. But what's really important here is making sure that you include people with disabilities in discussions about accessibility. And if you don't know where the people with disabilities are, the question that you need to ask yourself, and again, this is not just applicable to disability, is who's not in the room and why aren't they here? Because sometimes the reason why they aren't here is going to be as simple as three flights of stairs into the venue. So to recap, accessibility benefits everyone, not just disabled people. And you can do this really well by building accessibility into your design principles from the start. But it's not just about the web accessibility piece. Other issues like security risks can also be accessibility issues. You need to make an individualized assessment based on what it is that you're trying to do. Excuse me, my slides are stuffing up again. Thorough testing is really important. And the best case scenario is that you can get adaptive technology users to test your software themselves. But if you can't, think about the things that disabled people might need to do differently. And most importantly, regardless of whether they have accessibility needs or not, listen to your users.
I do want to give a couple of thanks to Melissa, who did my former colleague, who did the fancy corporate website mock-ups for me, Matt for the Atlassian Confluence screenshots, and my friend Annie, who produced the accessibility room bar drawing. We're not going to have time for questions. I'll be around. I have colored hair. I'm not hard to find. Come find me. My email is up there. There's also a link there to GitHub repo, which has all of the talks that I've previously done. And I've done a million different talks on accessibility. But it was amazing to be here to do this in person for a group of people for the first time. And thank you all so much for coming on this journey with me. Thank you.